All right, if you left the room during the break, then what you notice is on top of your machine, I put another handout. And what I've done in that handout is I've rewritten that program, the one I just showed you, so it's got it's modularized with working functions. I'm going to give you two more copies tomorrow because this one uses function declarations. You'll have two copies tomorrow. One of them will say on it function expressions, and the other one will say on it um, arrow functions. So you're going to have an example of each one of those. All right. I don't know how long this is going to take but probably most of the rest of the period, just because of the fact th this, <clears throat> again, is where we are tying together <clears throat> Excuse me, what we did in the first 20 days of class with what we're doing now. So, as is mentioned in here, JavaScript applications commonly respond to user actions. So quite often, you'll have something like a form, and you want to make sure that when there's a button on the form that's clicked that says submit, that it goes somewhere. All right? So as it says, these actions are called events. The functions that handle the events are called event handlers. To make this work, you attach the functions to the events. All right. Now, I'm going to bop back and forth between these two pages for a bit. But these are some of the events to which you can add event handlers. So you can see the events right there. I'm not going to read them to you. You can see them. The key takeaway, though, is notice where it says <clears throat> element. That means that any element you put on a page, you can write click event, double click event, mouse over, mouse in, and mouse out if you want to. All right. Buttons, typically about all you use is a click event. All right. Controls, that means like any time you put in a text box or a text area or something like that, focus and blur. I already mentioned to you what those are. Window notice has a load event. Notice what it says. The whole page has been loaded into the browser, including anything that the page depends upon external style sheets, images, etc. All right. So, as it says, an event handler is a function that's executed when the event occurs. Now, what you're going to notice and what these guys already know about here is last semester what happened was with the the IDE, the integrated development environment that we used, not Visual Studio Code, but Visual Studio. You literally, if you want a button, you drag it out from a toolbox and you put it on your screen. Boom, you got a button. If you double click that button, it opens up a click event for the button. JavaScript don't work like that. All right, now, would it work like that if you ran it inside of like Visual Studio? Possibly, I've never tried to. All right, but so we have to add the event handler ourselves. Again, the event handler handles the event. You code it like any other function. To attach it, you use add event listener. At least it's pretty intuitive. You know, you're adding this event listener. And when you add it, you put for as your first parameter the event that you want it to react to. And then after that, either the function name that you want to run or the function itself you put in there. So when you start looking at it, it does, at least intuitively, make a little bit of sense. So again, the first parameter is a string, meaning it has to be in double or single quotes. Look on the screen, please. That means these words right here, when you're adding an event handler, have to be put in double or single quotes. Don't just say click. It's got to be single quote, 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 click, single quote, or double quote, cl click, double quote. And again, get used to being consistent. Most people in here use single quotes. If you don't want to, use double quotes. All right. <clears throat> the second parameter, as it says, is the function that handles the event when it occurs. So either you put the function in itself if it's fairly small, or you call that function. All right. And if you don't know what I mean, you're going to see it in just a minute. All right. 
So it says the first example in this figure shows you how to attach, attach an event handler named join list that's coded as an arrow function and stored in a constant named join list. Well, that makes total sense. Well, then let's just take a look at the example. That's it there. So we've already got this function that we've written that's called join list. All right, when that function is called, all right, it's going to say the statements for the function go here. That's all it's going to say right now. That's kind of stupid, but you'd put more stuff in there. All right, this says that you've got a submit button with an ID of submit button. You're adding an event listener to it that says, when the button is clicked, call this. Please look on the screen. This is the most important part of this lecture. Do not put parentheses there. That actually says to call it. We're saying when you click the button, then call it. If you put parens there, it's going to call it. It's not what you want to have happen. So again, add event listener is the name of the function submit button or or something with an id of submit button is what you want this event handler to act upon all right the action is click and when you click you want to call that routine it's assumed that that routine has been written you know what i'm saying so if i called hello and i didn't have a routine called hello i'm going to get an error all right so here they're adding one to a text box and this says that if you've got a text box with an ID of text underscore box underscore one, if you double click it, call join list. So notice it's possible here to call join list from two different things, the way that it's set up. That's okay. All right. And I think that pretty much is everything that's on here. It goes through it again. If you don't like my explanations, read the book. And just so you know, if I come in here and I type in W3 schools, JavaScript event handler. Okay, well, look what it finds right away. JavaScript events on W3 schools. So if I click on there, if what I'm saying doesn't make a lot of sense, then look through here. They've got an example. All right, now the examples might be different than the ones in the book. But they, they, they all come with big explanations. And again, you can go into the try it yourself and you can change what's in there. So notice if I don't like this, the time is, I can just type in time right here, run it again, and I've changed that. All right. And when you click it, what does it do? Well, by default, it gives me, I'm telling it to give me a date. So it gives me the current date and time. says on the bottom of the page here, incidentally, there's another way to attach an event handler that you'll see in legacy code. All right, what that means is in the olden days, not always, but a lot of times when they mention legacy code, it's because different browsers handled it differently. So you had to do more work. If you want to make sure that it runs always, you might have to change a little bit of this code. We're not going to worry about it. We're assuming that everybody is using at least Internet Explorer 9. And if they are, that's not an issue. All right. Again, I, I showed you that back weeks ago with that caniuse.com. If you remember that, you can put different stuff in there to see whether or not the browser supports it. The reason that that's important is if somebody hires me to do a job and I write it and I don't handle legacy code, and somebody in the office, let's say, has got an old version of a browser or brings in a, an emulator or whatever, why doesn't this work? I want it to work all the time. So that's when you might have to go back and add some extra. All right, I'm not gonna read this, but this is a very good explanation. It just kind of crystallizes what we just went over. Okay. Not only can you add an event listener, if you don't want it anymore, there's a remove event listener. All right, if, you, if for some reason you want to turn it off. All right, next are anonymous functions with event handlers. 
I already mentioned this to you, but look at the difference. Here, you can already tell that the name of this is show message. You can everybody can look at that and tell that. All right. But down here, instead of calling a function, we actually wrote the function in here. You see this? See the difference? We took those two lines that are inside of the curly braces and we put them right inside of our add event listener. Now it's an anonymous function. We're calling something that's not named. That's what the anonymous part means. All right. And then they show another example because, again, there's different ways that you can do this. And I would say if you think, you know, I got, I understand everything you've been talking about the entire, the entire chapter. Good. But if you have problems, especially with this, read pages 142 to 156, the last 15 pages of the chapter, because it does a good job of going over this. All right. If you don't need to give the event handler a name, you can code the event handler as an anonymous function. It's a function without a name. To use it, you code the function expression as the second parameter. That's what I just showed you. All right. Now, look at this because it's kind of important that you realize. In this example, right, where is it? This one. All right. So technically, this is the first parameter, and this, all, all of this, is the second parameter. Does that make sense? It looks a little weird, and, you know, this is one of those examples or one of those times where a lot of this stuff was created to make life easier for experienced developers, but if you're not an experienced developer, it can make it a pain in the butt, all right? So while you're learning this, you may want to not do this when you don't have to, all right? All right. All right. Events have a thing that works with them that's called an event object, all right? What does that mean? Well, would everybody agree with this? You see a hyperlink. All right, you click the hyperlink, you go someplace. Would you agree with that? No. If somebody put a bad address in there, you'll get an error message like a 404 not found, but you go someplace typically. What if you've got a hyperlink in there and you don't want them to go anywhere? Yeah, are you with me? You just, you, you, they can click it, but you don't want them to leave the page. You can do a prevent default because the default is when you click a hyperlink is to go to another page. But if you associate with that a prevent default, then you make sure that what happens by default doesn't happen. As it says, it stops the default action from occurring. Now, here are the things that you're going to be working with most of the time. These are the default actions. Probably on most of these, the ones that you're going to be concerned with most of is either going to be the A tag, what I just mentioned to you, or a submit button. If I, if I write code that goes through an entire form and it finds any error in that form, anything, something was required and I didn't put it in, something had to be numeric and I didn't make it numeric, et cetera, then I don't want to hit submit. And if I hit submit, I don't want it to go anywhere because if it goes someplace, it's going to go to a server. They're going to find the error. They're going to send it right back to me. I don't want that. It's better for me to go and validate it on my end. And once I know everything's cool, then send it over to the server. And guess what? The first thing the server does is it runs the same tests I just did. Why? Because it is possible, if you really know what you're doing, to fake the thing out and make it look like what you're submitting is valid when it's not. All right? So all events have something associated with them, you know, it's, it's an event. And the event itself has all sorts of stuff that's associated with it, all right? So if I back up for a second to this page, I, I talked about the prevent default already stopping the default action from happening. Notice there is a current 
target property. Contains an object that represents the element that the event handler is attached to. So if it's a button, the current target is the button. If it's a text box, it's a text box, etc. All right. So when you look at this, what this is saying right here is when we're calling join list, we are passing a parameter. Remember, if there's just one, we don't need the parens. In the example that you see right here, all right, we could put it in parens, it wouldn't hurt. The, the parameter that we're passing is the event object itself. All right, and if you wanna know everything that's in it, take a program like this, like they have right here, and just write it, and then do, a, do like a console.log or an alert of event. You're going to get a big list of all sorts of stuff, 99% of which you probably never need to worry about. All right. And there's an example of a prevent default right there. So as it says, modern browsers all send an event object to the event handler that's handling the event. You can use the current target property, as it says, to get the element that that's attached to. And you can stop something from happening by using the prevent default method. So let's look at these two applications. These are going to be the first ones. These are going to be the first ones that are written. And I'm not going to lie to you. I'll go back and rewrite the miles per gallon one that I've done. But I'm going to use their stuff. I'm not going to take the time to go back and rewrite this. All right. So as it says, figure 413 presents the miles per gallon application from chapter 2. But this time it uses text boxes rather than prompts. And you may or may not agree, the text on those prompts wasn't very big. And you can't exactly like use your wheel on your mouse or whatever to make it bigger. And you, you would not make an end user, that would be a really stupid way to get input from them. Unless you couldn't think of any other way. It'd be much better to use text boxes. All right. So again, they're saying that the miles per gallon will be disabled. It says the CSS isn't shown in the figure, but in what you've got, remember, you've got all the book applications. All right. So you've got the CSS in there. So they're not going to show the CSS. All right. And there's an external file named mpg.js. So let's look at all this. So this is what it looks like. Again, whether you'd agree or disagree, I would say at least, this is much more reminiscent of the kind of thing you'd find in the quote, real world, unquote, as opposed to using prompts. Now, I don't know if they put in, we'll see it in a minute, but what I will put in here are a few things just to show you. For instance, what I typically do in here is I will add a message up here that's off times in red that says something like um, asterisk fields required. Required. All right. Then I'll put an asterisk here and I'll put an asterisk here. Does that make sense? To show you that they're required. Now, if you come in here and you leave it blank, it'll this will this will change from an asterisk to something like miles driven field required all right let's suppose for a second that we've got the same constants that we used before one in 1000 one in 100 so let's say okay i come in here and i put in 4000 then i don't want it to say miles miles driven field required i'll say something like miles driven out of range or some or maybe miles driven must be one to a thousand something like that and then i'll do something similar for the gallons used i'm not going to write that if they do this and they put in a valid value here and a valid value here i want those asterisks to, to disappear and i want there to be nothing there all right and just the answer and as you can see the answer is what? It is grayed out. That field is, is, is disabled. Plus, typically, if I'm going to go to the trouble of doing this, I'm not going to call this calculate MPG. I'm just going to call it calculate. 
And I'm going to have another button right next to it that says clear. And when I clear it, I want four things to happen. I want this to clear, so pretend that cleared it. I want this to clear. I want this to clear. And I want my cursor to go right there so I can try it again. All right. So they show you the HTML, not really substantial. It's a form. All right. Or maybe they didn't even create it. I guess they didn't even do it as a form. Okay, I thought they did. Doesn't matter one way or the other. They did it as a bunch of divs. And then here is the source file. So let's take a look at the source file. Remember, I mentioned to you before that use strict thing tries to make sure that JavaScript follows the rules, for lack of better words. It makes it less liberal, more conservative, whatever way you want to look at it. <clears throat> then this second line, remember that's an alias. If you think I don't want to really use this query selector, I just find it hard to believe or hard to use, as I mentioned to you earlier, there's another one called get element by ID. If you wanted to use that, you would just replace this. You would say const dollar sign equals, I, you can call this anything that says selector. I could just call it L for element. And then fat arrow uh, document dot get element element by ID L. You could do that too. All right. Since this book right now at least is concentrating on the query selector, that's the last time I'm going to say that. And I'm just going to use it the way they're doing. All right. Because I'm not trying to introduce complexity in it to, to confuse you. I'm just showing you that there's another way that you see it done. So we come in here. What do we have? Well, Here's our error message, and it says label must be a valid number greater than zero. What the heck is label? We'll find out in just a minute, okay? So that's for an error message, okay? So this is focus and select, all right? Focus and select. So remember, it'll put the cursor there, and it'll make sure that that is highlighted, all right? So what else do we have? Well, this looks pretty familiar. Const miles equal parse float, but look at this. This says find something with an ID of miles. Where is it finding that? The answer is there's got to be something here with an ID of miles. And for gallons, it finds an ID of gallons. So there's a constant mapping that's going on between the HTML and the CSS and the JavaScript. All right, if is not a number, miles, or miles is less than zero, notice what we're calling, get error message, and they're passing miles driven. So that's going to call this routine, and it's going to use miles driven. That's the label we're passing. So it'll say miles driven must be a valid number greater than zero. And then we do it again with the gallons. And if, if that was invalid, it'll say, Gallons of gas used must be a valid number greater than zero. So what I showed you before was putting that code in line and not writing separate functions. There's nothing wrong with the way I did it. There's certainly nothing wrong with the way they've done it. Theirs is going to re result in more compact code because we're writing the same function that will handle both cases. All right. So if we get down to here, we know it worked, right? That should look pretty familiar to you. This line right here is pretty much the same line I gave you. Now, what's different? Well, we're telling it to go back to your HTML and find the thing with the ID of MPG. That's that third text box, the one that's disabled. And dot value means put that value in there, set its value. When dot value appears on the left-hand side of an equal sign like that, you are setting its value. When it appears on the right-hand side of an equal sign, like up here, you are retrieving its value. So these, when you're retrieving it, are known as getters. 
when you are have it on the left hand side of an equal sign, it's known as a setter because you're either getting the value or you're setting the value. All right. And again, I think I mentioned most everything in here. Let's just take a quick look. So let's see. Oh, how about this? This says DOM content loaded right here. So this says when the whole thing has been loaded, then associate the button called calculate with the idea of calculate when you click it, call process entries. And when the form, when you first start running the program, take the miles, which was our first text box, and put the focus in there. If you get that, that's all there is to it. Now, when I say that, I'm not saying that's all there is to it. It's simple as hell. No, it's not. Because it's a different way of looking at stuff than the way we did before. But again, if you are planning on, on, on a career in web development, you got to understand this because this is how it's done. I, I mean, personally, I don't think I've ever seen a prompt when I've gone out to any website looking for something. They've got a form. All right. So, like I said, feel free to read that. I, I think I went over everything that was in there. All right, then they do another one with an email list. So let's, I, this is, I mentioned this one to you before. Now notice they've got two buttons in here. As I mentioned before with the one I showed you, I would have had a second button as well. So what are we doing in here? The email address, the notice that both emails must match and first name is required. Kind of nice to give error messages that are pretty much indicative of what the problem is. And you can put them out separately like this or like I showed you, and that's what I'll show you tomorrow. And that is putting them over here. So I'm actually gonna show you some stuff tomorrow that we're not gonna get into for a few chapters, but it's much easier than the way they're showing it to you, even though it's stuff we haven't talked about yet, but I'll go over it with you tomorrow, all right? So that's the HTML is to create the empty form right there. And again, let's take a minute and look at the JavaScript for it. Because this is it. I think this is, yeah, that's it. So let's let's finish this up and then we're done with the chapter. All right. This is the kind of stuff you have to start looking through and understanding. And I, I, I don't think I'm just saying this. If you look at the programs that are in your book, and again, you have all those. In that thing that I gave you, the you know, the at the beginning of the semester, there's a there's a thing in there that should be a folder of, uh, probably called books and or apps or something like that. And it's in there. All of the code and the solutions. In other words, anything they ask you to do something, they've given you the solutions for it. You've got all that stuff. So let's look at this. All right, this is join list. It's an add event listener to a click event. All right, so this is going to find whatever has an ID of join list, which I'm gonna guess, is that the button? I don't know. So join list, somewhere in here, there's something called join list. There it is, submit button with an ID of join list. See that right there. There, the other one is called clear form. So I am associating here with the click event of that button. I am telling it to do this. Everything that's in here. So it starts here and it ends down here. Now, look at this because this is kind of an important thing for you to realize when you look at it. All right. Okay. Here's a left parenthesis. Here's a left curly brace. And I know I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. But what I want you to realize is if I go down to the bottom of this function, that's the ending curly brace. That's the ending parenthesis. All right. A uh, mistake a lot of people make is they don't put an ending parenthesis in there. And if you don't do that, you haven't ended this. All right. And since technically this is an executable statement, you typically put the semicolon at the end. If you look at the end, you'll see that the semicolon is there. All right, so what are we doing here? We are grabbing the value in the first text box. 
we are grabbing the value in the second text box. The value of the first text box is being put into a local variable here called email one. The value of the second text box is putting in, being put into a local variable called email two. The value in the third text box is being put into something called first name. You most often will see the name that we used in the HTML, you'll give it the same name in your JavaScript, but you don't have to. We could have called this E1 and E2 and FN. All right, but typically you use the same name. All right. Then here, we're creating a variable called error message. Notice that that's not a const. It's a let because the error message is going to change depending upon what the error is. So if you set a value and it's not going to change, you can make it a const. We could, I could have gone back in those programs I showed you, we could have made a const for miles driven and, gall and gallons used. We could have done that and it would have worked. All right. So this is saying if the email is left blank, and again, remember, use three equal signs here, not two. Then the error message, we want to append to that first email is required. Append to what? Well, remember, there's more than one thing that could be wrong, correct? So let's say that you leave all three of these things blank. You leave all three blank. Then it should come back and say, email address is required. Confirm email address is required. First name is required. All right, you should put them all in. Here is a case where we've left, we've got two errors. The first line is okay, but the second two are bad. If email two is empty, so if email one is empty, first name is required. If two is empty, last name is required. But if you get, you know, notice they're all ifs too, because isn't it possible this could be and that one not be? Or, you know, there's four possibilities. They're both empty, neither is empty, one is empty and the other is not, or reverse that. So they're ifs, not else if with else if. Then if we get, we got to check here, if they don't match. Now, if they're both left blank, they will match. Now, they didn't do this, but what I would have done here, look on the screen, please. I would have taken all three of these and done the trim function on there. See that? Just in case somebody puts blanks in there, just get rid of them. So then we come down to here. So we've done the email stuff. There's three things to check for the email. Was the first email empty? Was the second email empty? And if, if neither is empty, basically, are they equal to one another? All right, then we do the, thing, the check for the first name. If that's empty, again, three equal signs, not two. So prevent form submission if there's an error. So if that error message is not blank, notice there are no space in there. That's just double quote, double quote, or single quote, single quote, meaning it's the empty string. So if the error message, we set it to the empty string up here. If it's still empty, we didn't have any errors. But if it's not empty, we want to call alert with that error message. And that's, we've been making the error messages here. And we want to prevent the default, which means we don't want it to go anywhere. But if it gets down, you know, otherwise it will. We could make it do something. I mean, you've all seen this where you click and everything is okay and it comes back with a message that says, we will get to your submissions shortly or something like that. Could have done that too. Had we done that, we probably would have put that in an else that's right here. All right, then to clear the form, again, notice the word value is on the left-hand side of the equal sign. So, the text box right there is being set to empty, empty, and empty. And then we're putting the focus to the first email. All right. And that's when we click clear form. This one is at the bottom of our entire thing. So this one says, hey, if you click the button that's called clear form, that's our clear button. We want to add an event listener that does 
all of this, everything that's in here, well, I'm trying, everything that's in there, all right? Otherwise, when you get down to the bottom of the screen, just set the focus there, period. All right. And again, I'm not saying that totally made sense or it totally didn't make sense. But if it didn't, it's in your best interest to go back and look at the book and some of the resources that I've, I've given you and talked to you about. All right. So let's take just a couple minutes here. And pause. OK. And I'm going to show you that this is the homework that I gave you before. All right. This is these are Muroc homeworks. So there's three folders. I'm not talking about the projects now. We will do that if we have time. And if we don't, heck with it. But here's your homework. So these are your starter files right here where it says exercise is short. If they do have one for chapter one, you don't have to do it. For now, for now, I want you to be concerned with chapter two, chapter three, and chapter four. All right. So these are the starter files. Notice test scores for two. All right. And for three, there's future value. And for four, there's two of them, miles per gallon and test scores. But what you'll want to do is open up either the Word version or I'll just open the PDF here. So, again, you don't have to do Chapter 1. But for next Friday, I think that's when we said they'd be due. But I'd like you to do Chapter 2, 3, 4, 1, and 4, 2. All right. So what are they? Chapter 2. Modify the test scores application. Boy, you want to know how difficult it is? They ask you to write the code to add a fourth test. That's literally what the homework is. So make sure that when you divide, if you've got four tests, instead of dividing by three, what number do you want to divide by? Four would sure make sense to me. All right, so that's that one. Then next, they, they've got this future value thing. So they typically give you one that works now, but then they want you to add to it. So add the code for calculating the figure when interest is calculated each month. Well, this is calculated monthly. If you've got an annual rate of 7.5%, you have to break it down into months. So there will be some division in there, maybe by 12. All right, makes sense? All right. Then enhance the miles per gallon program. Okay. So what do we want to do? Enhance it, it so that the entries are cleared when the user double clicks the miles per gallon text box. So when you double click here, everything should clear. If you don't want to do that, if you think, you know what, it's better to put a button here to do it, then do it that way. You're going to have to put in code regardless. But that's not taking liberties. I think that's writing it the way it should be written. Enhance the program so miles per gallon text box is cleared whenever it gets the focus. It says, incidentally, that's that one. It will not work if the box is disabled. So to test it, you'd have to un you know, enable it or remove the word disabled that's in there. All right. Enhance it so when the calculation is done, the focus leaves the gallons of gas text box, which is where it would be here by default. All right, it says to do that, and even tells you how to do it. All right. And then they ask you to come back and rewrite this using an arrow function. So this should be a good test for you. All right. Five, we're not worried about yet, we're not there. So again, these short exercises are the homework. Why am I telling you that? Because you actually, I would just go work on them all here. Then when you get done, copy them. You've got like a JS1 homework, JS2 homework. So copy the, the ones for, you know, et cetera. Does that make sense? All right. If you even want to change that, I don't care. If you want to make go and make yourselves a couple more repositories. If you want to make a repository called J, like JS homework and another one called JS labs and put them in there, do that. Some of you have been doing that and breaking stuff up. I don't care. All right, so that's those. Then for the labs, 
These are called extra exercises. So notice, for chapter two, you've got one. For chapter three, you've got four. For chapter four, you've got three. Most of the time, they will give you starter files, sometimes just working applications that they will say, now go back and make some changes to it, enhance it, in other words. So for chapter two, it says you'll create an application that converts Fahrenheit temperatures to Celsius by using the old prompt method. All right. So in other words, when you when you click it, it says when you start the program, it should run like this. It should say enter a temperature and then it should print out something that looks like this. Again, you've got a starter file. Develop the app. Just follow follow their requirements. Then you do an enhancement to it, and it says that this is the range. So you can put in any value between negative 100 and positive 212. If they ask you to enhance one you've already done, don't don't do it and then not save it, but write write the write the enhanced one right on top of it. You see what I'm saying? If it's two assignments, do it as two different assignments. Otherwise, it's just too hard for me to grade. All right. So that's what you have to do on that one. And add a loop so the user can do a series of calculations without restarting it. To end the, the application, the user should enter 999 as their temperature. I think both of those are still done with prompts. So is this one. Convert number grades to letter grades. Gee, didn't we do this one? Didn't I just show you the code for this the other day? All right. So there they are. That's that's the I used 90 and above, but that's what they're using. That's fine. Then there's the sum of numbers. So I could come in here and run this, and it says enter a number from 1 to 100. I could have 1, 2, 3, 4. I could do it 50 times. And if I put in every time another, you know, 1 to, 1 to 50, it should add the numbers from 1 to 50 and give me that answer when I'm done. How do I know when I'm done? I know that I'm done because it, when it says, do you want to do another sum? Well, that's rerunning it again. So it says, ask the user to keep entering with this prompt dialog. Then give the user a chance to do multiple entries. So it says, find the sum. Oh, okay, they want, they want you. To, I was wrong. So this would give you the numbers 1 through 5. See that? So you can put in a number between 1 and 100. If you put in 100, it'll add 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 all the way to plus 100. All right. And again, you get a starter file. Then there's a sales array. This is probably going to be the hardest one because it's working with an array. I'll let you work on it for a while. And if people have, have questions on it, I'll show you how to do it. That's okay. And for anybody watching this who's not in this class, I will not tape that. All right. And then there's a very fairly simple sales tax calculator. All right. So take a look at those and a change calculator. This one has the same kind of thing. So 67 cents. What's the most number of quarters? We could have two, which would leave us 17 cents, which would be a dime, a nickel, and two pennies. You're trying to come up with the most optimal way of doing this. I've had people do it and say, hey, can I put, instead of 99, can I make it 999? I don't care. Well, don't say, instead of uh, 99, can I make it nine? No, because nine cents wouldn't be a whole, you know, wouldn't be very challenging. And if you haven't already figured it out, that's going to be a series of divide, then modulo, divide, then modulo. So again, you'd be using their example. 67. If I take 67 and divide it by 25, I get two. If I take 67 and I modulo it by 25, I get 17. Then if I take 17 and I modulo, or I'm sorry, if I divide it by 10, I get one. If I take 17 and I modulo it by 10, I get seven. If I take seven and I divide it by five, I get one. If I get seven and I modulo it by five, I get two. So it's two, one, one, two. That makes sense? That's all you got to do for that one. All right. The idea is that you're, you're getting into a rhythm and you're understanding that there's, I, I, not to be mean, but there's not a whole lot of thought to most of these. All right. 
And is there another one? Yep. And income tax calculator. Again, this one's a little difficult too. All right. So you should be able to put in an income and tell my, tell how much income tax is owed based on that. All right. And I think you all know where it says of excess over means that if it's more than that type of thing. All right. So, and next week, well, towards the end of the week, we'll be looking at five, six, and seven. Notice five doesn't even have any. There's nothing here. Five is going to be on debugging. So it's how to go and find errors that you have. So there'll be not, there'll be that one here. And in the short exercises for chapter five, I think there's one. You debug the miles per gallon. They give you one that's got errors in it so you can figure out how to fix the errors. All right. Questions? All right. I know you didn't get much time today. Sorry about that. You get about almost 45 minutes.